Well, good morning and welcome to New Life Church. We are so excited that you chose to worship with us this morning. We just invite you wherever you are at just to press in, just to, just to open up and just let God's presence just move in your lives, in your homes, wherever you're streaming at. Amen. Your life 
So I could be free, so I could be whole, so I can tell everyone I know you thought I was one. Lift 
you high, we'll adore you, we'll worship you, we'll honor you, we'll serve you, Lord, we'll praise you, we'll worship you, we'll magnify, we'll lift you high, we'll love you, adore you, we'll serve you, we'll honor you, Lord, we'll praise you, we'll worship you, we'll magnify. 
these past weeks, it's, it's crazy how the government can just come in and interrupt our schedule and everything could just be changed. Schools could close, jobs could close, everything could just change. And then I think about how Paul, he, he had a plan in mind. And while he was on his way, he was on the road to Damascus. But then the Lord, he came in and he interfered. And everything that Paul thought he was going to do, his whole life would make a complete 180 turn. So now the government can interrupt your life. But if you see this as a chance to just press forward, to press into the presence of God, you may have been going down a path, but your life can have that complete 180 turn the same way that Paul had. And God can use that. And this time will be known as a testimony for you. Instead of this time where you see it as quarantine, where you see it as a time where you're stuck in your house, this is a time where you can consecrate yourself and let God know I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready to turn this thing around. This time that I had to spend with you, it was what I needed. I needed to be refilled. I needed to be replenished. I needed to be set forth back before you. So church, although we can't meet physically, take this time to just consecrate yourselves. Let God know, yes, the world was getting to me. Yes, I was getting tired, but now I've been refilled. I've been fueled, and I have a new passion. I have a new desire. God, I pray that you use our time, the time that we spend at home, the less time that we have from work, those doing online classes. Father, I pray that you encounter all of us. Let us know that you're still in control. Father, I thank you. We thank you for the time that you've given us to now spend more time in our word, spend more time to worship you. Father, I pray that as we continue, we continue with these services when, all, when thousands are streaming online, or your word is being broadcasted that everyone could hear. I pray that you would meet them right there in that place where they gather together. You would meet them right there in that place that you would interfere. Father, we thank you. And we love you. I pray that you have the rest of your way in this service. Be with pastor as he speaks the message. Be with those at home, those who have needs. We pray over them. In your son's precious name, my prayer. Amen and amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It is so good to connect back with you at the same place, same time. Happy Sunday. I hope you are enjoying your Sunday. Um, and yes, we are quarantined, but that means we're still closer. We're still a body of Christ. Come on, somebody. We're still connected. The devil can't keep us apart, and he definitely cannot keep us from praising the Most High God. And I am so excited that you are joining us this morning for Sunday service because we are thinking about you. We have been praying for you, and we know that COVID-19 will pass. But in the meantime, it is church as usual. It is prayer as usual. It is worship as usual. It is Jesus as usual. He is good. He is on the throne. He is to be exalted. He is awesome. His word is alive and he is preparing you. This is a season where we stand firm in the goodness and the grace of God and know that we are thinking about you and your family, especially during these seasons and this time. And the word that Bishop is going to preach is, I believe, something that the throne room of heaven needs for you to hear this morning to encourage your faith and to keep your walk. But before that, I do want to talk to you about continuing to support the ministry that is going on here at New Life because the enemy's not sleeping, so that means the saints can't sleep 
gift either. Come on. So we need you to give because, frankly, the lights and the bills don't get paid unless we have the tithes and the offerings of the saints. Um, I'm pledging, even though my family's been personally affected, um, to continue in committing my finances to the Lord because that's what the enemy wants to do. He sees the circumstances and he wants fear to take a hold of you. I personally work for the airline industry. We have been hit harder than anyone else. And it was fun, <laughs> for lack of a better word, to get a call or a, a message that says, just so you know, we're cutting your pay, but we have a job. So I choose not to focus on the fact that my pay is being cut. I choose to focus on the fact that I still have a job. And so I'm going to testify to God by continuing to give my finances and continuing to tithe because he is still providing for me, even when I feel that I am lacking, even when I feel like I don't know where it's coming from. He's still good. And so the way you can do that is actually through online. If you go to orlandonewlife.com, that is our church website. That's where you can connect with us on every level. If you go there, you can give, press the give button. It'll take you right to our engage page. And there you can commit your offering or your tithe. But if you are wanting to connect via cell phone, pull it out right now. I'll help you. I'll walk you through it. I want to make sure that you memorize this number because I'm memorizing the number. It is 407 216 0730. And if you go ahead and you type in that number, you can actually just text to give. So what you will need to do is type in offering, for example, spell out the whole word, space, and the amount you want to give. Or you can even do your tithes this way, T-I-T-H-E, space, and the amount you want to give. And all that funding um, goes right to us and continues to keep this ministry afloat and abreast. Um, and we're just excited that you are continuing to partner with us, especially in this tumultuous times when it's it's easy for you to give up the faith, but I know that God sees you. I know that he appreciates what you're doing for his servants and the ministries that you're involved with, and we most definitely appreciate you guys. Some other ways to engage with us throughout the week. Because we are separate, that does not mean we are far. Uh, we want to make sure that you have and are plugged into new life throughout your week. Do not forget about us, church. So, of course, we have our website, orlandonewlife.com. But we also have a Facebook page where you can actually watch our Sunday services live. We have a YouTube page. Um, our Facebook page is New Life Orlando. It's quite long. Let me make sure I get it right, y'all. You know, I don't want to be messing up the wrong information. It is New Life Church Orlando FL, just FL. And then our Instagram for you millennials, you picture seekers, you know, if you want our feed to be popping, add us on Instagram, Orlando New Life. And then we also have a YouTube channel that you can connect with us at. It's New Life Orlando, oh, New Life Church, parentheses, Orlando. So three avenues for you to touch base with us. On Tuesdays, this Tuesday the 31st, we're going to do our very first hour of power. We're praying together. We have one of our members, Sandy Nazir, and I co-hosting that. It's going to be live coming to you on IGTV. But in order to connect with us, you got to tune in. you got to add us on social media. So it's Orlando New Life, our Instagram page. We're coming live to you at 6.30 graphics coming up. We're praying for you. If you have prayer requests, DM us in the meantime. Message us privately on Facebook. Write us on our church website. There's multiple avenues for us to be making sure we are uplifting you in prayer, especially as we come together as a body of believers. On Wednesdays, I'm coming at you with the word. It's going to be live on our Facebook page, so hopefully you tune in for that as well. Premieres at 7 p.m. And then we're also starting a teaching series, our Foundations class, which will be hosted by our bishop, our very own Mark D. Todd was coming to you live with the foundational teachings of what it means to be a believer. And that is something you don't want to miss. This is a season of preparation, church. This is a season of standing and knowing the word of God and being filled and also being founded in all that is God and all that is good. And so we want to make sure that you're touching base with us throughout the week and connecting with us throughout the week. So I feel like I've done enough talking. I'm sure you feel like I've done enough talking and you are ready for the word of God on this Sunday morning, right? Come on. So if you could, right where you're at, in your living room, wherever you may be at, give a huge, huge round of applause for my bishop and yours, Bishop Mark D. Todd, as he comes to the stage to bring the word. Uh, she embarrasses me. <laughs> but uh, it's 
good to be able to share the Word of God with you today, and, uh, and looking forward to that. Uh, I appreciate uh, our team that is here uh, giving of themselves so that we can continue the ministry and, and preaching the gospel and sharing that, and appreciate all of these, these volunteers. Uh, so right there in your, in your living rooms or wherever you're watching it at, you might be, you might be in the car at, at a red light. Hopefully you're not watching on driving, but uh, if you had a red light right now, just give a little hand for all of the volunteers and staff here at New Life. We appreciate, uh, appreciate them and their, their hard work, don't you? All right, I want to share the word with you today, and I've been talking about fear the last, uh, the last three weeks, and, and today I want to continue on, the, on that thought and want to talk about overcoming fear in, in your crisis, overcoming fear in your crisis. 1 Samuel 17 is, going, is the story we're going to get to here in a minute, but let me just ask you this question. Do you, do you like the story of an underdog? Do you like it when you... When you know you're watching a movie and you, you, you know that the underdog's going to overcome and they're going to win, right? We, we like those kind of stories. We, we like the story when, the, when we know that the, the underdog is going to overcome the adversity and they're going to triumph. We love the story except when it's our story and we're going through the process and, and we're not quite sure yet if we're, if we're going to overcome. We don't like the underdog story when we're the underdog and having to go through it. You know, and how you handle that situation, how you handle the situation when you're the underdog, your actions, your choices, it's, it's paramount to, to whether or not it's going to end up being a, a feel-good, triumphant story or, or if it's going to turn out to be a tragedy. And, and sadly, there are many Christians who go through crisis but the, they, they haven't handled their situation very well, and they allowed their, their story to turn into heartbreak, into tragedy. When you, when you take a look at how the Christian church, uh, how it began, how, it, how it, it, it didn't appear that they had an underdog's chance of succeeding. When you think about it, the, their, their leader, Jesus, has he's been crucified, he's buried, and then spends 40 days, and then he goes back to the Father... He's not there. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and all the churches launched forth. But in just, in just a few years of those 12 disciples, 11 of them are, have been put to death. The, the 12th is in a prison camp. He's been exiled. It seemed that all of the religious and the political powers of the early centuries spent such a great deal of effort in an attempt to, to put down the Christian church. And they wanted to destroy it in its infancy so that it would never really take off. But this underdog movement continued to spread in, in spite of persecution, in spite of opposition, in spite of everything that seemed to come against it, the church continued to spread the gospel that life-saving message of Jesus Christ. And even now, we find ourselves in a situation, in this situation that we don't have control over it, that there's this pandemic that we can't control, that there's nothing physically that you and I can do to cure this coronavirus. It puts us in a situation that, that's bigger than us. We're facing a situation that's beyond our abilities and our power. And as I was just thinking about that aspect of it this past week, I'm, I'm reminded of the, of the very well-known story in the Old Testament of a, of a young man thrust into crisis. That he is he's thrown into a situation that's much bigger than he is. He's thrown into a situation that's, that's way beyond his abilities. And it instantly makes him... An underdog. It's the story of David and Goliath. The ultimate underdog story. And, I, and I'm confident that you probably all know the story and probably know it real well. Instead of retelling the whole thing, I just want to look at the crisis. I, I want to look at how he, he handled the critics. I, I want to look at how he dealt with the, with the contest. And, and I want to 
I want us to see how David responds to these things. So here's some lessons from David today. I hope you're taking notes there. And I hope you're still involved in G2. Your G2 group, probably not, not meeting personally. But they should be meeting at least uh, on Zoom, Skype, Facebook, somehow. So I encourage you, stay involved in G2. Here's some lessons from David. Y'all ready? First one is this. You need to handle the crisis or it will mishandle you. You can either handle the crisis or it's going to mishandle you. you. And you probably know the background of the story. The Israelites, they're, they're at war with the Philistines. They're at a standoff. Goliath, the, the giant, is daily coming out. Israel's on one side of this valley. They're on the side of the mountain. On the other side of the, the valley, on another mountain, is the Philistines. And Goliath would make his way down and stand out in the valley and issue this big challenge. Send out a man so that we can fight. Instead of our armies having to come and fight against each other, just send one man out. And he and I will, will do battle and will save many lives. But he, he taunts them day after day. They're in, they're in crisis. The Israelite army is terrified. They're, they're, they're facing a challenge that they don't see how, how they could win. Their, their crisis is a, it's a crisis a lot like what we seem to face in our lives. I mean, I mean just think about it. The crisis was, was greater than David was. The crisis was greater. Verse 4, it said, Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the, the Philistine ranks and faced the forces of Israel, and he was over nine feet tall. We know that his armor weighed over 125 pounds. He carries this big, massive spear, and just the spearhead alone weighed, weighed 15 to 16 pounds. He, he's a massive, massive man. And the Israelite army looks at him, and they think Goliath is too big to be defeated. And because of that, they're afraid. They're, they're demoralized. Goliath's words and his taunts, it, it just added to the shame and to the, to the fear that they felt. And, and Goliath is given the same speech day after day, 40 days. He's given the challenge. And it wasn't just to the, the Israelite army. He, he's really, he's challenging the God of Israel. And, and for them... The army to ignore the challenge or to decline it, I mean, it would mean humiliation to both Israel, but it would also mean humiliation to God. And so, verse 11, 1 Samuel 17, 11, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. See, when you look at this and you read this, this passage, when Saul and the Israelites heard it, terrified, deeply shaken. This is the difference between not having the Spirit of the Lord at work in your life as it once had versus those who have it. See, Saul had been, had been anointed to be king. And, and when he was chosen to be king, it was the, because the people were so impressed with him and with his size, with his strength, with his abilities. And and when the Spirit of the Lord would come upon Saul, he was a fearless warrior. But if you turn to chapter 15, you see that, that Saul was disobedient, disobedient to God. He, he, did, he did something that's so egregious to God that God would literally say, I'm sorry I made Saul king. And with that, God removed the anointing off of Saul's life. Saul, I mean, he... he Previously, what, what was so full of courage, a, a warrior king would lead the troops into battle. But now, with the Spirit of God having been lifted off of his life, with that anointing gone from his life, he hears the taunts of this, of this giant, and he's, he himself is, is cowering in fear. And all of Israel is going to feel the same way that their leader did. And they're all terrified and afraid. And this is what too many Christians have started to do themselves when they, they see and they hear the taunts of the giant in their life. 
looking at things in the natural and they see the size of the giant and they begin to cower in fear. And I don't know what size of giant you're dealing with or what giant you are dealing with, but for the vast majority, we're dealing with a giant called Corona. Or you might be dealing with a, with a giant maybe called cancer. It might be a giant called divorce. Your marriage may be failing. You may be in the midst of financial problems and the giant that's looming about is bankruptcy. But whatever giant it is that you're facing, it may seem, it may seem so much bigger than, than you but I want to tell you, there's some lessons from David that you can learn to do. So you can learn to deal with it and you can handle it. And the second thing that we see about David's crisis, he had a crisis that defied his power. In verses 10 and 11, we, we defy the armies of Israel today, Goliath said. Send me a man who will fight me. And this is what giants do. They scream at us. They, they make us tremble in fear. They... They do everything to intimidate us so that we won't even engage in the battle. And we want things nice. We want things just to be easy. We want to be able to control every detail. But all of a sudden, then this crisis comes along and, and we see how truly out of control things are. That we, we can't control our situation. We have no control over what's going on on our planet right now. We have no control of what's going on in the U.S. or even Florida or even right here in Orlando right now. We don't have control over that. And this pandemic has made so many people feel powerless, right? And with David and this crisis, we see that it was a crisis that just wouldn't go away. And then verse 16 tells us that for 40 days and nights... Goliath's taunting them. He wasn't going to go away. The problem of the crisis wasn't just going to disappear. And if you don't deal with the crisis, then the crisis deals with you. Somebody needed to step up and to deal with the crisis that Goliath was bringing to them. See, it didn't do any good for the, for the Israelites just to, to hunker down in fear, to hide themselves. It wouldn't do any good to pretend it's not really real it wasn't going to do any good to say, you know what, let's just have faith and we'll speak a positive word and, and just that'll take care of it. it. No, it had to be dealt with. David had to step up. Nobody else was doing and he was going to handle the crisis. So look how he handles it. Verse 26, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? See, what I notice is that David puts the crisis into the proper perspective. He puts the crisis in the proper perspective. And that's something that we need to learn. And it takes me to life lesson one today. It's this, that the best response to a crisis is God is bigger than any problem I will ever face. God is bigger than any problem that I will ever face. David puts the crisis into the proper perspective. Yes, Goliath's real. Yes, Corona is real. But God is bigger than any problem that I will ever face. Corona's real. Cancer is real, but God's bigger than any promise that I'll face. Bankruptcy may be real, but God's bigger than any problem that I will ever face. And some of you need to be reminded today that even though your crisis is real, so is your God. That your God will never leave you or forsake you. That he is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. That he's your rock and your fortress, your strong tower. That you can run to him and you can find strength. And in him you can find your peace. And he's all that you need. Your God is bigger than any problem you'll ever face. Amen? Amen. Second lesson from David. Don't allow critics to detour your mission. Don't allow the critics to detour your mission. See, if you're going to do anything worthwhile in your life, you will have to face and endure some criticism. If you're going to do anything great for God, 
there will be people who are going to criticize you for it. If David had adopted the same fearful attitude that the Israelite soldiers had, the same fearful attitude that his own brothers had, he would have never even wanted to try to do anything about the crisis. He would have just, let's just leave it alone. I, I, I'll just deliver the food to my brothers and I'll just slide on back home. No one would have ever said anything about him. No one would have ever criticized his, him or his motives or his actions. But as soon as David began to talk about the possibility of defeating the giant, he's met with all kinds of criticism. David's not the only dreamer in the Bible who's criticized for wanting to do God's will. I mean, think about it. Noah, Moses, Joseph... Nehemiah, Peter, Paul, and of course Jesus, they are all criticized for attempting to do something for the glory of God. And if it'll happen to all of them, you can bet you'll face it too. So life lesson two is this. Criticism should be expected if you, if you expect to accomplish anything worthwhile. So you've got to learn to handle it or it'll mishandle you. Now, that doesn't change the fact that criticism can be hard to endure, that it can be painful, unkind, hurts your feelings, make you want to cry, but you've got to learn to handle it and not allow it to stop you. Now, now there are some things that you need to keep in mind, and if you do it, it makes it easier to, to handle it when you recognize the, some characteristics of critical people. Characteristics of critical people. One characteristic is that they are obsessed with the trivial. Obsessed with the trivial. Verse 28 talks about David's oldest brother and how he, he starts to focus on some of the trivial things. What are you doing around here anyway? What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I mean, really? You're more concerned about a few sheep of dads than you are about this giant who's calling out all of Israel and defying God? You want to focus on the fact that there might be a few sheep that somebody's not watching after at the moment? When our whole country might be, might be killed and we are brought into, into slavery again, and you're more concerned about the sheep? But his brother was being a critic like most critics are. Not focusing on what was really important, the most important moment of, of their lifetime. And critics have the amazing ability to focus on the trivial and neglect what's crucial. Another characteristic is that critics believe the worst about people. They believe the worst about people. It says in the latter part of verse 28, his brother said, I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. And critics always tend to believe the worst about people or they tend to think that they, they know better how to do it. It's amazing how, how critics think they always can do it a little bit better but are not willing to, to try I read this story this week about Francis Asbury. You've heard of Asbury Theological Seminary. It was right over there near Valencia, right, right there by where our, our own Ashley used to live. Francis Asbury, the school's named after him, but he was, he was an 18th century bishop in the Methodist movement. He was once criticized by a woman for being unsophisticated in his method of evangelism. And so Bishop Asbury politely asked the lady, how many people have you led to Christ in your lifetime? And, and, and the lady answered, well, she hadn't personally led anyone to faith in Christ. And so the bishop's response was, ma'am, I like my way of doing it better than I like your way of doing it. 
Critics often want to criticize how other people do it when they don't even bother to try to do it themselves. That's typical of the critic. We're not going to try, but we're going to tell you how you ought to do it or how do you ought to do it better. And David's response to the critic or to the criticism. In verse 30, David, he, he walked over to some others and he asked the same thing and received the same answer. In other words, he didn't get focused or caught up in trying to debate his brother. He wasn't going to go there and try to change his brother's mind or tell them why all of his intentions were good. He wasn't going to get caught up in some trivial argument with his brother. Can I say to y'all, stop getting caught up in these trivial arguments on social media. Just let it go. Scroll on past. Block them. Don't get caught up with it. David refused to be swayed by the criticism. He recognized that criticism wasn't going to change anything. Their criticism wasn't going to get the job done. And he would never defeat the Goliath. He would never reach his destiny if he allowed his life or his thinking to be swayed by the criticism. So life lesson three. When you, try, when you try to accomplish anything great for God, you will be criticized by those who are doing nothing. Be prepared for it, but don't let it stop you. Don't disregard the dream that God has given you. Don't disregard the destiny to which God has called you because somebody wants to criticize you or your motives or your way of operating. And then there's the third lesson from David is that you have to step up and you've got to fight the fight. You can't win the battle if you don't fight. You, you can't become an overcomer in the contest if you don't get into the contest. You, you can't win a battle if you don't engage in the fight. And until David stepped out onto that battlefield, he could just be looked at as, as some kid with a big idea. But the moment that he was willing to step out there when he lined up against Goliath, it was obvious he was a man to be taken seriously. Even if he lost the battle, David proved that he had more character, more integrity, more faith than any other soldiers in the king's army, even more so than the king himself. David won that contest just by his, his willingness to enter the contest. So let me wrap all this up today by talking about David's strategy in battle. And what I see is this. First, you have to establish the terms of the battle. Establish the terms of the battle. And in verse 40, it tells us where David picked up five smooth stones from a stream. He puts them in his shepherd's bag. And he's armed with just the the sling, the rocks, and, and his shepherd's staff. And he heads across the valley to face the Philistine. Goliath, with all of his taunts, with all of his weaponry, was not going to force David to fight him in the way Goliath was accustomed to fighting. David didn't get, he didn't get a big sword and say, let me see if I'm a better swordsman. He didn't borrow somebody's spear or javelin. He didn't wear Saul's armor, even though Saul was saying, hey, here, put this on. Da David was saying, all of those things are unproven to me. I, I, I don't know how to use these things. I'm not experienced with, thing, with these things. I've not been practicing or gifted to use these, but I've got a gifting that God's given He's given me this ability, and I've been practicing with this ability, and I feel confident that God will use me in what he's given me so that I can overcome. 
Everybody else tried to da tell David how to fight that fight. But he was insistent, I'm going to use what God's given me and what he's proven in my life. Some of you need to hear that. You need to stop trying to wear Saul's armor. You need to stop putting on somebody else's armor. You need to stop trying to fight battles with somebody else's weapons when God's given you other weapons, other giftings, other callings that you need to accept who you are in Christ Jesus, be comfortable there in your own skin, devote it fully to Him and allow God to use you in it. The second strategy was that David refused to be intimidated. When he steps out there to face off with Goliath, he wasn't intimidated. He had nothing but that slingshot, five smooth stones, his shepherd's staff, and the anointing of God upon his life. And when David or when Goliath tried again to intimidate him, yelling, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David refused to be intimidated. He, he responds to him, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And today the Lord will conquer you. The Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead body of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. I love how he finishes in verse 47 where he says, This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. Can you imagine? I mean, this teenage boy facing off with this more than nine foot tall giant, an experienced warrior, and he refuses to cower down in fear. David refuses to be intimidated by Goliath, and he refuses, he refuses to play Goliath's game in the midst of this contest. He approaches it with boldness, with boldness from the Holy Spirit. That boldness from God that he could face the enemy. And life lesson four is the last one. When intimidating giants taunt you, face them with boldness from the Holy Spirit. You want to know how to speak to the giants? You want to know the attitude that you need to have to win the battle? You cannot cower down in fear. You, you need the boldness of the Holy Spirit. You need it to come upon your life. You need to look at the adversary and say, I'm going to cut your head off. I will be victorious. God will bring, bring that victory to my home. See, our, our tendency is to be timid when we face a battle. That wasn't the attitude of David. Now, now, David didn't face Goliath or approach him with, with just some reckless abandon because he knew that the battle was not in his hands. That's why he said, this is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. The Lord's battle. When, when you face your giant, you don't face it with reckless abandon. But realize this is the Lord's battle. And, and I'm going to be obedient to Him. I'm going to use the gifts He's given me. I'm going to operate in my lane. I'm going to operate in my gifts. I'm going to operate in my calling. I, I, I'm going to do what's wise. And the Spirit of God will, will rest upon my life and He will use my life so I won't back down from the giant and I won't cower in fear. You shouldn't fear the contest. Face it. Face it knowing it's the Lord's battle. See, David had something the rest of the Israelite army didn't have. He was, 
He was able to destroy this enemy that was older, more experienced, much bigger and stronger. But it wasn't because of David's size or his abilities or his talents. It wasn't that David was brave and these soldiers were cowards. It had nothing to do with it. David could face Goliath because he had faith in God's goodness. He had faith in God's goodness. And we serve a good God, don't we? And since God is good, this crisis cannot last. The the critics can't be right. And the contest can't be lost. Since God is good, the victory will be ours. You may be facing Goliath in your own life right now. But remember this. God is bigger than my problem. Remember to ignore the critics. And remember, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. David faced Goliath and he believed in God's goodness. And I'm telling you, believe in God's goodness. Trust in it. And I'm telling you, he will give you, he'll give you the faith, the the strength to face your Goliath too. Today I want to pray with you and pray over you. Wherever you're at watching this right now, if you're having a watch party and there's people there with you, I I want you just to pray for one another. And I, I want to pray, I want to pray over you and that that God's presence and his spirit, his anointing just fill that place wherever you're at right now. And and that if you've been feeling fear, if you've been feeling intimidated, I I, I pray that the the spirit of God come and minister to you today as, as I've quoted the verse couple times the last few weeks for God has not given us the spirit of fear or timidity but of power, love self-discipline or sound mind do not allow fear to take hold in your life trust trust in the goodness of God trust in Him ask Him to move upon your life. Ask Him to minister to you today. Ask Him to bless those in your family, those in your own household. I I pray that the Spirit of God be with you and that He keep you, that He keep you safe and well, that no virus be allowed to, to come into your home. And I also pray, though, if you are, sick right now. I pray God's divine healing touch to be upon your life. I pray that the healing virtue that the Lord has provided us and Isaiah tells us in that by His stripes, Jesus' stripes were healed. I pray that healing be poured out upon you today. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I I pray over your people. Lord, I pray health and strength upon their lives and their bodies. I, I pray that the healing virtue just begin to flow and minister. God, restore every, every cell within their immune system. God, keep them divinely strong, well, and in divine health. Father, I pray over your people. God, as they're facing many different things, Lord, many are facing uncertain economic times. They're facing financial hardships, and I pray, Father, that you will bless, that you will supply, that you will meet those needs in their lives. 
Father, I pray that your people will continue to grow spiritually. Lord, even during this time in which we can't get, gather together, Lord, may the Holy Spirit minister to them. Minister wherever they're at and watching this now. Father, give your people strength and peace and comfort, Lord, that they will triumph, be triumphant, that they will overcome. Lord, that they will overcome any fear in the midst of their crisis today. Bless your people. And as states and songs, now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, my strength, my redeemer. God bless you. I pray this word has encouraged and challenged you today. I encourage you to share it with somebody. Let's keep loving people. Let's keep lifting up one another. I love you. This church loves you. God bless you.